want to begin by welcoming all of you who are here for our symposium as we continue the launch of the Historic Center for Reparation Research. I also want to welcome those who have joined us on live stream, courtesy of UWI TV. Thank you, UWI TV. I believe we're also on New Start 93 FM Live, and this is wonderful. I'm very pleased to see all the students here, and I want you to be recognized because you will have to take up the struggle. So, Excelsior, where are you? Make some noise. <laughs> Arden. <laughs> Immaculate. <laughs> and there's a school coming in, so come and take your seats very quickly. There are seats over here, please. Take your seats quickly. Who am I missing? Campion. My two sons went to Campion. So welcome, Campion. You can't make noise. <laughs> All right. OK. Now, so welcome to this historic day. Today is October 11. It's the day on which Paul Bogle, Letitia Gohagan, and others said to Governor Eyre, and British colonialists, enough done be enough. That reminder is critical. Today is the start of the anniversary of the Morant Bay War, when the cry for justice rang out across this country and the region. We are into Britain's Black History Month. Let Britain hear the cry from Africans that we want justice because justice repairs all crimes. And let us all buy the book Britain's Black Debt by Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. And that book is on sale outside. And give a copy to someone who doesn't know but needs to know. Educate those who do not know or who have forgotten or who are acting out of willed ignorance. The debt has not been paid. The accounts have not been settled, says or late reparation activist Dudley Thompson. This is also Heritage Week in Jamaica. Yesterday was Maroon Day in Suriname. Tomorrow will be International Reparation Day and Indigenous People's Holocaust Memorial Day. And Friday in Trinidad and Tobago will be the day which has been declared by the government of Trinidad and Tobago as Indigenous People's Day lest we forget. So welcome again to this conversation reparation. Ensure that you register and continue to support all the activities for today. I want to welcome especially our guest, Ms. Samia Nkrumah from Ghana. Make her welcome. Professor Horace Campbell from the Kwame Nkrumah Institute at the University of Legon, Ghana. And of course, Ms. Samen Nkrumah is the daughter of late president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. You'll be studying Kwame Nkrumah on your new Cape history syllabus. So you better greet her afterwards and ask her questions about Kwame Nkrumah, her father. I want you to say hello to Dr. Julius Garvey, son of right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Minister Lashley, who is representing the Prime Minister of Barbados, Right Honorable Frondel Stewart, and of course, Speaker of the House of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Honorable Jomo Thomas. I want to welcome especially the members of the National Council on Reparation Jamaica and the CARICOM Reparation Commission members. If, if the CRC members are here, please stand to be recognized. If NCR members are here, please stand to be recognized. Welcome to all of you leading in the struggle. So settle back and let me ask Ambassador Richard Bernal to introdu introduce our speaker, and then you'll hear from our Vice Chancellor. Welcome again. Akwaba.
Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to this conference here at the University of the West Indies. Very timely and important. It follows the ceremonial opening of the Center for Reparations Research yesterday. It's not my unfamiliarity with protocol, but I'm following my instructions. Otherwise, I might not get to the podium to introduce the Vice Chancellor again. I'm told I, all the dignitaries have been acknowledged. Let me welcome them again and welcome all of you to this session. My task here is to be brief and to be the forerunner of the Vice Chancellor. I would like to break my commitment to acknowledge Professor Verine Shepherd. She has been an outstanding scholar and has put her scholarship in the service of the disadvantaged peoples of the world. I'd like you to acknowledge that. <clears throat> and I'm sure I speak for all of us here when I extend our congratulations to her as the head of the newly established Center for Reparations Research. Today it is my pleasure to briefly introduce to you Vice Chancellor Sir Hilary Beckles. Um, one has a choice in introductions. One can read a long um, bio, which would probably take up most of his speaking time, but I won't do that. What I will try to do is to highlight some things for those who don't uh, know all about him and to tell you a little bit about his work. Let me begin by saying that he is the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He is a scholar who has put his scholarship at the service of the development of the Caribbean and peoples of African descent. He's a visionary educator He's formally trained as an economic historian. He has served on numerous international commissions, ranging from sport to reparations, has served on several United Nations committees, Commonwealth committees, etc. He has written numerous books. Professor Shepard just um, commended you to read Britain's Black Bet, Reparations for Slavery and Native Genocide in the Caribbean. Um, I highly commend it to you as well. But his scholarship extends quite wide from slavery to sport. <clears throat> what I would like to say, which you won't pick up from his biography, is that as an economic historian, he is different from other historians. Most historians are satisfied to doc document what happened and to explain what happened and leave it there. But his concern is for the economic development of people of the Caribbean and African descent. And therefore, what he extracts from his study of history are the lessons which are pertinent for us going forward. And that differentiates him from the typical historian. Also what distinguishes him is that, as Karl Marx said, the purpose of understanding the world is to change it, not merely to understand it, but to change it. And lastly, I would say that he has undertaken a very challenging task as chair of the Caribbean Commission on Reparations and he has extended that leadership beyond the Caribbean to the global scene on a topic which many people doubt will ever be realized, which is reparations. I leave you with a quotation which I paraphrased from the late Norman Manley, national hero in Jamaica. In his final speech, he said, nothing great is ever achieved by those who lack the commitment and the belief that it is possible. So he has taken on a struggle along with all of us, which appears difficult, but one of the lessons of history is nothing is impossible. So with that, I would invite Sir Hilary Beckles to address us this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bernal. 
um, veterans of our reparations movement and struggle and the next generation of leaders in this movement, we thank you all for coming. I am not surprised that um, after the brilliant presentation by Ms. Nkrumah last night, that the students from the girls' school immaculate made a loudest, loudest noise. I, I think there's a relationship between that. Um, this presentation will be a summary of some of the main issues I think we are trying to deal with. And I will try to historicize, I will try to historicize as much of this as I can. What we are all dealing with is post-colonial impoverishment of the black people of the world. I'm going to be speaking about the Caribbean context, but effectively this is a global issue. It is the same in the United States in the post-colonial period, what was historically called the South Plantation Complex, the Caribbean, Latin America, Africa. This is, this is a global issue of the journey of black people in the years after their enslavement and societies that were colonized. So it really is a broad concept. And we're looking at this post-colonial poverty, marginalization, and persistent racism. I use the concept because it was in 1972 that George Beckford of this campus wrote Persistent Poverty, which has been a manifesto for a generation of academics trying to understand the persistence of black poverty in the post-colonial world. And how in all of these societies, despite the tremendous efforts of the black community to move forward, to accumulate wealth, to advance, what you see consistently in all of these societies is the persistent transfer of wealth away from the black community into the white community. This takes place through land transfers, land grabs, where black people are pushed out of the villages and lands that they have purchased. And in the USA, we have seen recently some remarkable work showing how in the 19th century, after two generations of emancipation, tremendous wealth was accumulated. And then that wealth was reappropriated by the white community through torture, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, local government, and the dispossession of the black community as they came into the 20th century. In the Caribbean, we see the ghettoization of our people, the vast majority of our citizens living in what we call ghettos across the Caribbean. From the north to the south, the majority of black people trapped in these ghettos and trapped in rural poverty. And wealth through labor exploitation, through minimum wages, no wages, massive unemployment, cheap labor, the cheap liberalization of the black community, wealth is being transferred constantly to the upper class community. So this is really the legacy that we are dealing with of slavery. The result of this is that we are all now living in a time in which the primary discourse is about economic growth. We must do all that is required to achieve economic growth. And this is a good thing. It is necessary to have economic growth. You cannot have development, broadly speaking, without the generation of wealth, the creation of assets, and the development of an economy. So you do not critique in and of itself the concept of the focus upon economic growth. But in the context of these societies, the Caribbean and the black communities of the world, economic growth resonates in a very negative way. Because there's an association with further poverty. There's an association with further marginalization, deepening racism. As economies grow, the wealth is never, ever distributed fairly equitably. So economic growth tends to generate even more racism, 
even more black marginalization. And thus, in our history, the concept is problematic, and we have to understand that. Uh, in the Caribbean, many of you are aware that in the last 15 years, for example, uh, Trinidad and Tobago had 15 years of relatively uh, advanced economic growth, averaging 3 to 4% growth per year over the last uh, 15 years. But at the end of those 15 years, poverty had increased. The measurements show that after 15 years of economic growth, black poverty had increased, and inequality in the society and in the economy had actually increased. So why is it then that the economic growth led to more black poverty? Why did the economic growth lead to more black marginalization, resulting in a crime wave that has now taken over Trinidad and Tobago, Port of Spain especially? has to do with the structures that we have inherited from the slavery period that have persisted into, into the present time. So, yes, it is a problematical context, and then the issue of robbery and what I call trickle-down theft. So, the fact is that economic growth is generally, in our history, associ associated with the robbery of the black people and the trickle-down theft through cheap labor the use of cheap labor. And of course, in Jamaica, we know this very well because there's an army of cheap labor uh, in this country and the upper classes of Jamaica have become accustomed to having a mass of cheap labor which they use in their households and in their industries and so on. But the Black Lives Matter movement is significant here. Now, the importance of this movement is that in the slavery period, black life mattered most because the most valuable asset in slavery was black life, because it was the main source of wealth. On an estate, on the plantation, the most significant asset was black life. Slave owners invested their wealth in black life, so black life was the most important asset in the development of the economy. So they gave priority to it. They gave massive priority to black life. It was at emancipation in those societies where black people began to move away and to forge their own independence and freedom, then black life did not matter as much because they took the labor they needed and what they considered the surplus labor was disposable. So the irony of the Black Lives Matter movement is precisely this. That for 300 years, black life was all that mattered. But now, it does not matter to those who own the wealth. And that is the nature of the history. It's important to, to feel these, these shifts in, in, in time. And here is a statement I wish you to take a little time and read. Because this is really the core of what I'm going to say uh, this morning. This is Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel laureate. Um, first vice chancellor of this university, uh, one of the greatest intellectuals of this region, if not the world, uh, recognized for his economics with a Nobel Prize, a great son of St. Lucia and the Caribbean. But as a young man, as a young man, just recently out of graduate school, he wrote a little pamphlet called Labor in the West Indies. And it's a pamphlet which most people know, but yet, no one as yet have picked up on this statement which is embedded in that pamphlet. Most people who have participated in the labor movement use this pamphlet as their uh, Bible. But here's a statement he made, which is important. He's asking the question, what right do we have to make a reparations claim on the British people? And then he says, well, the answer is very clear. Our ancestors generated the wealth that made Britain the first industrial nation. Then he says, it's a debt that has not yet been repaid. This is the basis of what we are speaking about. 1938, Sir Arthur. And he is not known. In fact, many people have said that Sir Arthur is a right-wing, conservative, neo-colonial economist. That is what was said about him in his early days. 
But yet, he is saying, this debt has not been repaired, and it has to be repaired. And he goes on to say, there will be no economic development in the Caribbean that is sustainable until it is paid. This is the critical thing. It, is, it has to be paid. Now, the background, of course, is the perfect crime. Britain's perfect crime. What's a perfect crime? A perfect crime is a crime that is committed before the very world. Everyone sees it, knows it, but you walk away scot-free. No judge, no jury. No accountability. No explanation. No expression of sorrow or grief. You walk away triumphant from the crime and the scene of the crime. And why are you able to do this? Prime Minister Tony Blair, in 2007, when his country was celebrating the end of their slave trade, the bicentennial of their slave trade, he said, we did nothing wrong. We committed no crime. We have nothing to ap apologize for. He says to his parliament, we did nothing wrong. Slavery was legal because we made it legal. We, the British Parliament, made slavery legal. And therefore, it was legal and we acted within the law. So no apology. No reparations. Then his successor, David Cameron, came to Jamaica, as you heard last night, spoke in our Jamaican parliament, and a parliament filled with the descendants of enslaved Jamaicans. And he says to the parliament of Jamaica, yes, yes, slavery was pretty horrible, but get over it. Get, get over it. Time to get over it. And he says that to our parliament and our country. Get over it. The persistence of the arrogance and the hatred. And I want you to, to feel that those postures are embedded in an underlying philosophy that says, who are you? What are you? We, we do not apologize to lesser people. You, you don't. You don't, I mean, when you decide you want to have some curry goat, and you go to the butcher and you say, well, could you, I have a goat here, could you kill the goat? I want to eat some curry goat. You, you don't apologize to the goat. There is a perception then that we are the children of chattel. Because we were chattel, we were property. We had no humanity. We were defined in the law for 400 years as real estate. So we are the descendants of property. You do not apologize to your property. The perception is we are still their property. Hence, the posture which they have adopted. But let us, let us look at how our ancestors have responded to this. I'm going to come through. And I'm going to show and illustrate that the reparations process in which we are engaged right now at this moment in history, this is the seventh wave of this movement. We are now in the seventh wave, wave of a reparations movement. So I'm going to go through the first, second, third, all the way through to put you in, this, in the mainstream of where we are now. What was the first the first wave. The enslaved themselves demanded reparations. When the British passed the act of abolition, the enslaved people of the Caribbean were sending letters to the British Parliament saying to the British Parliament, we know that you are discussing emancipation. It has been discussed in your Parliament. And we know that you are discussing given reparations to the slave owners. But we are entitled to reparations. So in the British parliamentary papers, there is reference to enslaved people asking for reparations for the use of their labor 
free labor, and their ancestors. So the first declaration of a need for reparations came from the enslaved themselves. And Thomas Buxton, who was pushing the emancipation legislation, he supported the enslaved people of the Caribbean. He said in the British Parliament that the enslaved people are correct. They are entitled to reparations, and the Emancipation Act must have reparations built into it to give the enslaved people payment for their cheap labor, their free labor, and all the crimes committed against them. So all through the 1820s and 1830s, when the emancipation discourse was going on, Buxton was pushing for reparations for the enslaved people based upon comments made by the enslaved themselves that they are entitled to reparations. So we have the evidence and the data that speaks to this first wave of reparatory justice rooted in the notion that there should be no emancipation without reparations for the enslaved. That, of course, was defeated. When you also read the summary statements of the debate in the British Parliament, the Parliament's position was the black people of the Caribbean are not entitled to reparations because the act of emancipation itself is the reparations. That is what was the conclusion of that debate, that the act itself was the reparations. Though, of course, we know that this act, this act of emancipation was the most racist act passed in the history of the British Parliament. And I will tell you what I mean by that, because it's, it might seem surprising. You go through 300 years of British legislation giving effect to slavery. But the critical piece was the Emancipation Act itself, because that was when the thinking of the British Parliament and the British people became particularly clear. Now, in order to give emancipation, in order to pay compensation to the owners of enslaved people, the British Parliament in the first part of the legislation had to argue that the African peoples, the enslaved people, are not human, they are property. And that is the crux of the matter, because the British Parliament had been fudging this issue for 200 years. For 200 years, the question was being asked, are enslaved people property or humans? And the British Parliament had been fudging it, fudging it. Yes, no, maybe, perhaps a special kind, but yes, fudging for 200 years. And then suddenly now, they have to make it pollutedly clear. If you are going to pay property compensation, the first thing you have to do is to define the thing as property in order to put a value on it and then to pay property compensation. So the Emancipation Act required that the British Parliament, first of all, define the African peoples as property, then agree to pay property compensation to those whose property was being taken from them. So the act itself moved through two philosophical stages. One, we now recognize that the 600,000 600, enslaved people in the Caribbean are property. Their owners are entitled to property compensation. And the parliament has a duty to evaluate the cost and the replacement cost of this property and pay the owners of this property just compensation. That is why this act, this act, as they said, was the final nail in the coffin in respect of how the British Parliament looked at the African peoples. And so they paid their 20 million in compensation. Now, the second round of the reparations debate. Immediately at emancipation, immediately at emancipation, the question now is, what are we going to do with these 600,000 freed black people in the Caribbean? What we know, they must not acquire land, they must re re remain landless, they must remain cheap labor, and the labor must be cheaper than in the slavery period. 
So we must make sure that they are paid a wage that is less than what it would have been in the slavery period. And we know the slavery period, you have to feed them, you have to give them clothes, you have to give them shelter. You evaluate the cost of that, and then at emancipation, no housing, no shelter, no food, rent, wages, what is the cost of it? And you suppress it below the level it would have been had they been enslaved. Thus, the debate, the nigger question. This gentleman here, Thomas Carlyle, arguably one of the most respected British philosophers of the time. In fact, probably classified as the most popular and celebrated British philosopher, wrote a pamphlet reflecting upon the Caribbean. And he called the pamphlet on the nigger question. And basically he argued that reflecting on the Caribbean 10 years at emancipation, the British Parliament had made a tremendous mistake in freeing the black people. The black people are in the Caribbean, they're unemployed, they're sitting around on the mango trees eating mangoes, they're not working, they're sleeping all day, the women are having babies, the men are not working, and all hell has unleashed in the Caribbean. 600,000 black people lazing around doing nothing. Emancipation was a terrible mistake, and this is what he argued in his book and his pamphlet on the nigger question. John Stuart Mill, God bless him, replied to Thomas Carlyle on the nigger question and said, his argument was, the African people in the Caribbean are entitled to compensation for the 300 years of free labor. The racism against them is inhumane. The structures of ownership preclude them from accumulating wealth. And what we have done in Britain is to continue slavery under a different name. And that we are extracting wealth from them in the same way we extracted wealth from them during slavery. And he argued that the African peoples in the Caribbean have a just claim to compensation. And so Britain's two leading philosophers, John Stuart Mill and Thomas Carlyle, have squared off on this discourse that became extremely popular. Almost everyone who could read was reading this. It was in the newspapers, it was in pamphlets, public lectures, the debate on the nigger question. Then the next, the next reparations claim. The discourse, Paul Bogle, Karl Marx. Karl Marx entered the conversation. He entered the conversation in his essays on colonization, and he understood very clearly the economics of Caribbean colonization and the role the Caribbean had played in generating wealth in the British economy. The thesis, which was later developed by Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, is embedded in Karl Marx's work. That yes, the Caribbean economy generated the critical surplus that enabled the British economy to take off. It had been growing at 2 to 3% per year on average over the 17th and early 18th century, and suddenly Britain moved to 7, 8, 9% growth per year because of this injection of wealth coming from the Caribbean pushed the British economy at a higher rate of sustained growth. Karl Marx explained all of that and argued that the Caribbean peoples were at the center of the modern world because they are responsible for creating the first industrial nation, the wealth of the Caribbean. Paul Bogle sought to extract his share for the people of Jamaica. Land, peasant development, the right to vote based on the ownership of land. And Paul Bogle knew that if the people possessed the land, they were entitled to possess the land. And in his comments, he said, the people of Jamaica have a right to own the land. There can be no emancipation without land ownership. And Bogle was very clear, very clear. You cannot have social and economic development of the people unless it is rooted in land. And so he instructed his people to take possession of the land that was available, idle land, lying fallow, available to the people of Jamaica. For that, of course, he lost his life and hundreds of other people. 
he was trying to emancipate, to bring real emancipation to the second generation of free people by rooting their freedom in land where they could have the right to vote, where they could feed themselves, they could end the poverty and the malnutrition. He took that step. And the British position was, under no circumstances must the Jamaican people acquire land. Because if the Jamaican people acquire land, who will work on the sugar estates? The future of the sugar estates depended upon the black people being landless. And therefore, Bogle was threatening the economic model that Jamaica had accepted as the growth paradigm. So economic growth in Jamaica required black landlessness. Economic growth in Jamaica required that Bogle and his people did not possess land because cheap labor was required in the agricultural economy. Bogle demanded reparations. Karl Marx made the comment, yes, the people of the Caribbean have a right to justice. That was the third iteration. Then comes the next iteration. 1860s, the British people are still reflecting upon whether emancipation is a mistake. And remember, there's still slavery in the United States. There's still slavery in Brazil. There's still slavery in the Spanish Caribbean. So there's slavery all around. You only have Haiti, and now, critically, in large numbers, the British Islands. But all around the Spanish Caribbean, North America, Canada, all the way down Latin America, there is still slavery. The British people are thinking, did we not make a mistake? We made a mistake in freeing these black people. So they sent Professor Froud, professor of history at Oxford University, to come to the Caribbean to do an intellectual review. And he came out and he wrote a book called The Bowls of Ulysses, A Tour to the Caribbean. And he repeated again that the black people in the Caribbean are degenerating. They are reverting to savagery. That freedom and black people don't go together. Black people need to be tutored. They need to be placed on the strict tutelage. He said it was a mistake. Who replied to him? J.J. Thomas, a young Trinidadian who was born at emancipation, 1840. His parents were slaves. He taught himself to read and write, became a brilliant intellectual, the first black intellectual of the West Indies. And he wrote a book called Fraudacity, that fraud had the audacity to come to the Caribbean and spout out his racism and his, his, his negrophobic commentary. And Fraudacity, this book, becomes the first Caribbean black discourse on the need for reparations and black liberation, written by a young Caribbean scholar, self-taught, born after slavery. First, the foundation on which all of us are resting now today. That book made him a global superstar. He was invited to Oxford, to England, to give speeches, and he decimated Froude's argument. He made the, sec the fourth claim for reparations. Then the 1890s, massive starvation in the Caribbean, poverty, not just starvation, famine, famine among the black people of the Caribbean. They sent the Royal Commission down, and they said, well, what are we going to do? to end the famine of black people 50 years after emancipation. The commission said, give them land. They need to be given land. Excellent report. Give the black people of the Caribbean land. The British government said, no land. No land, no reparation. Despite the Royal Commission's report that says, give them land. No land. Then came the revolution of the 30s. 30 years after the plea to give black people land as reparations, rejected by the British government, Marcus Garvey organizes his regional movement, his global movement, demanding reparatory justice. This led to the revolutions of the 1930s. 
Then we had the Moyne Commission that came to investigate the revolution in the Caribbean. The Moyne Commission also said the black people of the Caribbean are entitled to reparatory justice. The British government suppressed the report for five years, held it to last of the war, refused to publish it, and then, of course, in the end said, no reparations, no land. So what I'm speaking about is decades after decade of demands and requests being rejected by the British Parliament because of the perception of who the black people are in the Caribbean. No reparations. Churchill made some very racist statements about black people. No land. No justice. The colonies must remain as colonies. Then we came to the independence movement. Every report that was written demanded that Britain should roll out a reparation strategy for the Caribbean to accommodate independence. They all asked for it. They were all rejected. Each request was rejected by the British Parliament. No Marshall Plan, no development plan. You want the independence, take it and go. But no reparations, no economic strategy, no economic aid other than perfunctory, superficial. No structure rejected. Faked, faked independence. 1948-49 Commission, the Standing Closer Commission says the islands must be federated and the federation must be subject to a Marshall Plan for Economic Development and the amount was estimated that is required to build the Caribbean, rejected by the British Parliament. This gentleman, the first president of Trinidad and Tobago, 1962, Ellis Clark said, how are we going to build an independent island without a Marshall Plan? How are we going to build an independent economy without reparations that the people are entitled to? Are we not spending in mud? He asked that question. Errol Barrow of Barbados asked the same question. When he was rejected, he said, the time has come to stop loitering on colonial premises. Now we have a generation of prime ministers who were born after independence. Prime Minister Andrew Holdis is the one and only prime minister that was not born under colonialism. He's a new breed, a new breed, the first of his kind. What will this new breed of politicians do, those who, were, who did not experience colonization? Born after independence, how will they see the world? This is important. The Rastafari have been making their claim all along. All along. Then, of course, we now have the CARICOM Commission that has been established. Letters have been written to all of the prime ministers of Europe calling for a global summit. The replies have come in anemic. Well... We know we owe the Caribbean something, but we're not sure about the reparations. We will, you know, we'll discuss it. We'll meet with you to discuss it, but not reparations. But here we have it. The black states of the Caribbean now being classified as failed states. The black people are being defined as having a, a black a psychosis of inferiority. The skin bleaching is driving our people into the arms of a colonial perception of beauty. The behavior is being described as implosive, that black culture is imploding upon itself. All of these discourses are taking place, that the black community is imploding culturally. We are hearing this from certain ideological sources, that the young people are no longer energized and focused around transformation. Those debates we have to confront and debate, and you students will have to engage these comments about your generation being an implosive generation as opposed to an explosive generation. This are comments which I think all of you are prepared to engage in. The hurricanes have now shown that we have colonies in the Caribbean. The Americans don't care about Puerto Rico. The British don't care about their colonies. We still have colonies all across the Caribbean. And what we have seen is the colonies are now left to flounder the lid has been blown off. 
the Caribbean is still colonized. We are still perceived as a colonized people who are subject to second class treatment. The repayment, the debt. What do I suggest? What do I recommend? This history, reparatory justice, the movement, the struggle, the concepts, one. I suggest that the entire Caribbean domestic debt be capitalized and turn into a grant for social investment and democracy. In other words, the British left us to clean up the mess. When Jamaica became independent, 70% of the Jamaican people could not read or write. They became independent and yet three quarters of them could not read or write and the British says, well, go and develop. Go and develop. Massive illiteracy, few schools, few hospitals, terrible urban situation, massive rural poverty, go and develop. We're walking away and Britain walked away. The result is that the governments of Jamaica, like all governments, then had to spend millions and billions of dollars to build schools, education, health. That was a social investment in democracy that has to be repaid. The people of Jamaica have committed to democracy, they've committed to social development, they've committed to transformation, they've overexpended what they don't have to turn you all into citizens. That is a debt that Britain should have paid before they gave independence. They should have contributed to this process. They didn't contribute, they should contribute. Then there's the issue of the 20 million. This 20 million that was paid to slave owners should have been paid to the enslaved. We have to make a claim to that money. That 20 million that was paid to the slave owners that claim, we have to make that claim. We have an entitlement to that 20 million. The value of that 20 million in 1834, today's value, that is 76 billion pounds. That is the contemporary value of the 20 million, 76 billion. We are making a claim on this 76 billion pounds that was paid to our enslavers. We have a right to that. We are going to demand it. Then we're going to offset the international debt offset the international debt against the 76 billion that we are insisting upon. Then we are asking for the creation of a Caribbean sustainability fund to clean up the colonial mess. We need a fund, that, a Marshall Plan, to help to clean up this mess that we've inherited, that we have been trying to clean up, but we cannot do it by ourselves because we did not create it and despite our best efforts, it is overwhelming us. Britain has to play its role. The 76 billion pounds have to be offset against all of this. So we're saying the cancellation of domestic debt, which is capitalized as a social investment in democracy, the offset of the international debt against the claim, and the creation of a fund. And this is where I believe we ought to go in our next step to demand and to bring the British to the table to discuss the process of reparations. And if we can take this conversation to the higher level, make these demands, call for a summit, this should become the basis of a summit which the world can then participate to make sure that the enslaved people and their descendants are entitled and have a right to justice. I thank you. When you're impassioned about a subject and you know a lot about it, it's sometimes difficult to cram everything you want into a very short speaking space. However, um, when you listen to Sir Hillary, he's so absorbing and enlightening that you sometimes don't realize how much time has passed. But it's always worth it. Um, we're not going to have time for questions, but I would say to the students that don't be intimidated by Vice Chancellor, Professor, and Sir. He's a very approachable person. Feel free to speak to him during the interval. I'm sure you would like me once again to thank him for this enlightening opening remark and I'd ask you to show your appreciation again. Thank you. Thank you.